which is in North Dakota. <laughs> Monsignor Shea was, in 2009, he was made the sixth president of University of Mary, and he was the youngest college and university president in the U.S. Uh, he comes from North Dakota. He's the oldest of eight children. Um, he studied in different places, including Washington, D.C. He studied in Rome before. Uh, he's also served and worked with Mother Teresa's Missionaries of Charity. Uh, he's got a broad experience that he brings to us today. He's on the board of directors for Focus Missionaries. Um, he has a, numerous roles. Um, so we invite him today because he's got particular insights on young people, college, university life, and in particular with our faith in the current times, in our culture, how our faith fits, and how it can be a great strength and blessing for us. So please help me welcome Monsignor Shea. Everybody, great to be with you. Why don't we start with prayer? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Most High and Glorious God, cast your light into the darkness of our hearts. Give us right faith, firm hope, perfect charity, profound humility, with wisdom and perception, that we might always know and do your most holy will. Amen. I'm really grateful to Father Lowry for his invitation to come and be with all of you tonight. And in admire of him already, I think that uh, the work that he has done here over the course of 11 years at uh, the Newman Center in Northern Arizona State has, uh, has already borne great fruit. And so uh, it's great to see that here in the evident faith that all of you hold uh, in your devotion, in the celebration of the Mass, in the full adoration chapel before Mass, uh, in the reverence with which the servers serve the Mass, and in Father's really magnificent homily. Uh, in which he reminded all of us uh, what it means to trust in God in the midst of suffering, setback, and disappointment. And so, Father Lowry, thanks for having me here. I'm really grateful for that. <laughs> I'm also a big admirer of the Bishop of this diocese. I um, uh, served with him on the National Advisory Committee to the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops 100 years ago, a long time ago. And uh, he and I conspired on certain things. And I've always admired him because his mind is clear like a bell. It's very beautiful, his devotion to the church, uh, his love for the people whom he serves, and his clarity of mind about questions of doctrine and morality is really uh, something to, to be admired in a bishop. And so I'm really grateful uh, for him. He, of course, invited the University of Mary to come here to this diocese uh, where we have a little project called Mary College at ASU. Uh, and so we're present down at the Newman Center at Arizona State University. And we offer classes in Catholic studies and uh, theology down there. And it's a great, uh, great joy for us uh, to be down there as well. Uh, long ago, I dated a, a girl from Northern Arizona State University. Uh, that was a long time ago. So that, I don't know what to say about that. <laughs> I am on the board of directors for Focus, and isn't it a joy for me to see uh, Focus missionaries uh, who are here? And uh, that's a, a great joy. In fact, I see a familiar face too with the University of Mary sweatshirt. That's a beautiful thing. And, um, and so that's a, it's a great joy for us to be able to serve Focus. Of course, we have new staff training at the University of Mary, and so focused missionaries come uh, to the University during beautiful June. June is like your February <laughs> in North Dakota. And, um, and they, they spend weeks there in training, and it's always a, a joy to welcome them here. I went up to see the Grand Canyon today. I'd seen it many years ago, and I hadn't seen it in a long time, and it, it, it hasn't changed. <laughs> it's, it's, it's maybe only a millimeter or two deeper than when I first saw it. But you know, it takes a long time to carve all that rock. 
Has anybody here not seen it yet, even though you go to school here? Okay, so let me just shame you. <laughs> there's no excuse for that. There, there's just no excuse. You have to go up and see it. Because, because your belief in God, isn't that true, everybody? Your belief in God can be fortified by experiences that take you out of yourself. In other words, uh, I, I think, that, I think that, that one of the things that has to happen in our lives, in our spiritual lives, and this is a reflection for no, uh, no direct uh, connection to the top, one of the things that has to happen in our spiritual lives is that uh, a space needs to open up inside of us whereby we're able to love and appreciate and treasure the things of the world without wanting them just for ourselves. This was one of, I think, the great geniuses of St. Francis of Assisi. I was praying one time at Fonte Pimombo, which is the place where Francis wrote the rule of the little brothers of St. Francis that he founded, and I was praying, what was his genius? And what came to me in the midst of that was that he, he had found a way to expand his heart in most of our hearts, there's too small of a gap between that's beautiful and I want it, give it to me. That, that space is just too small. And St. Francis was able to find a way to open up his soul such that he was able to see things and be breathtaken by them without wanting them for his very self in this greedy, grasping fashion, which is what marks us who are sinners. And there are experiences uh, that are meant for you and for me that do that. When you walk into a great cathedral, one of these great vast spaces of worship, nobody but, delud but a delusional person walks into a place like Char Cathedral or Cologne Cathedral in, in France and Germany and says, I want this, give it to me. That doesn't happen. Instead, a cathedral opens up a space where you're able to find stillness and be breathtaking with beauty without wanting it for yourself. Music does this too, to listen to Mahler or Beethoven, uh, and also uh, experiences of natural beauty do this. You don't go to the Grand Canyon and say, I want all this. <laughs> you don't do that. And so as a result, it can, give, it can be therapy for your soul and begin to open things up inside of you such that you're able truly then to live. And you want that, and I want it too. And I want to speak a little bit about that in the context of the coming season of Lent. I've come here tonight just to say a few words about the situation that we face in the world today and how the church is addressing it, and how each of us individually face challenges that the culture is throwing at us, which are very stern in which we have to take stock of and be ready for and prepare ourselves for in order to live not just faithful lives, but free and happy and holy lives too. In order to achieve the greatness for which we were created, it's absolutely essential that we fortify our minds and our hearts with the Word of God, with the Gospel as it truly is, and with the battlements necessary to resist some of the stern challenges to our faith that the culture itself, the culture in which we live, is throwing at us. And so here we come into the season of Lent, which is, I love the Eastern Orthodox call the season of Lent that, that, that time of bright sadness. <laughs> it's great. They call it, they call it like the season of bright sadness. In other words, of course there's a sadness and a mourning which is supposed to happen during Lent because we experience within ourselves another gap, a different gap from the one that I was just talking about. We experience the gap between who we were created to be and who we are right now. And that chasm, which St. John Paul II spoke about often in his existential philosophy, that chasm between who God created us to be and who we are right now, that enormous chasm uh, is something which the Lord wants to heal in us. And Lent is an opportunity for us both to mourn over that distance and see the brightness of hope that God's grace can accomplish in us. And that's a journey that we can't take by ourselves. That's why it's so important for all of you to be plugged in and involved in the Newman Center here, to find a community of faith in which together as friends, you can 
go forward toward heaven and toward God. It's really great. I didn't go to the Grand Canyon alone, by the way. I, I had some great people with me who I'd like to introduce very briefly. Uh, these are three young women who work at the University of Mary, but who are involved in a great project of the Holy Spirit for the foundation of a new religious community for the renewal of Catholic higher education. Dr. Julie Yardwood, Emily Lisney, and Mary Ann Hofer are here tonight. They're special guests. So in any case, um, the season of Lent, we come to the season of Lent and we hear words that we've heard so many times from St. Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, right? This is the centerpiece, kind of, besides getting ashes, it's the centerpiece of that Ash Wednesday service, the words of St. Paul, where St. Paul is quoting scripture and says, in the words of God, in a time of favor, I heard you. On a day of salvation, I helped you. And then St. Paul says, behold, now is the time of favor. Now is an acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. In other words, uh, there is a moment for us in which we're meant to be renewed and reminded. And we have to call to mind, and I'm going to say just a word in a moment about how the truths of our faith are sometimes slippery to our memory, how oftentimes we need to be reminded of them. But, but let me say a word first, just briefly, about our, our current cultural situation. We are living in a time in which the Christian foundation upon which Western civilization was built has rapidly been slipping away. The cultures of Western civilization, and to include our own culture here in the United States, was founded upon uh, Christian understandings about the human person and the world in which we live. And many of the institutions uh, have a Christian foundation to them originally. And yet, for the last 300 years or so, in an intense, intense way here recently, there's been a thorough and a deliberate de-Christianization of things, such that now we find ourselves living not in a pagan culture. Sometimes people say that and it's not true. C.S. Lewis, who I like very much, once said, oh, no, no, we're not living in a pagan culture. He said, give me a good old pagan. A pagan is just a Christian waiting to happen. <laughs> that's, that's not what we have here. What we have instead is a post-Christian culture. And he said that there's a difference there. And, and he used this phrase. He, he used it. I didn't use it, but I'm quoting it, so I'm only partly culpable for how sharp <laughs> and painful it is. But he said it's the difference that dealing with the, the original culture that the first Christians evangelized versus the culture in which we find ourselves, which is a post-Christian culture, in which people think that they've heard the gospel, that it has nothing to do with their lives and they've had done with it. It's the difference between wooing the heart of a young maiden winning the heart of a young girl who's looking for love as opposed to trying to win back a jaded and cynical divorcee. That's the difference. And it just illustrates how very hard it is because we live in a culture in which people think they know all kinds of things about what we believe and who we are. They don't think oftentimes very good things about us. And maybe they have bad memories from their childhood or whatever. But the Christian foundations of our civilization have been uh, slipping away. We can make a great mistake in a time like this. And that's this. We can go about the work of the church in a business as usual mode. In other words, we can make a huge mistake by saying, you know what? We're going we're gonna to do what worked in the past. And we're going to expect the same kinds of results. No, the church has to actually think and shift and go into a different mode in a time that's not what I would call a Christendom time. And by Christendom, I don't mean the medieval situation where by the church and the state we're closely related and where... Um, uh, where there was that formal alignment. I mean, uh, a time in which the, the, imagine, the imagined vision of people, the way that they saw their lives, the way that they saw the world, the way that they related to the institutions in their lives, the family, 
schools, government, or deeply founded by Christian ideals and values, by the gospel, seasoned by Christ. That's a Christendom time. Now we're shifting back into something more like an apostolic time. And when the popes here recently have been talking about the new evangelization, so uh, 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 Paul VI uh, talked about Europe becoming a mission field. John Paul II talked all the time about the new evangelization. Benedict XVI established a dicastery in the Vatican for evangelization. Pope Francis is talking about this all the time. In fact, he said very poignantly, he said in, in the in, in Aparacida, which was a gathering of the uh, Latin American bishops, he said, uh, we aren't living, everybody says that we're living in an age of change. No, we're living in a change of the ages. A seismic shift. The tectonic plates of culture and civilization are moving in a way that they haven't moved in hundreds of years. And if the church doesn't adapt her strategies to that and develop antibodies against a new aggressive secular culture, they're going to take us off one by one. We won't, we won't be able to stand up in those stern winds. The church will survive. The church will always survive. But we ourselves, building the church in our age is like building a house in a gale wind. It's hard to do. It's worth it, because then you can be inside. But it's, <laughs> it's hard to do. And so we need constantly, everybody, to, to find ourselves rooted in the Word of God and returning to that Word for what's foundational to us in our lives. Okay? And I want to say just a word about why we need to be reminded constantly and why for us to participate in this new age of the church, for us to meet with joy, with a winsome gladness, as happy warriors of truth and faith and hope and love, to meet the challenges of this new culture, in order to do that well, we have to drench our hearts and our minds in the teachings of the church, in the teachings of Jesus, his own presence, and his word in our lives. St. Peter, writing in the New Testament, says to his hearers, I will remind you of these things all the time, even though you know the truth of them, even though you founded your life on them. I'm going to remind you of them all the time. And so I want to just ask a question with you tonight. Why do we have to have Lent every year? Why every year do we have to hear that? Um, that exhortation from St. Paul that now is a very acceptable time of favor. Now is a day of salvation. Why? Why do we have to hear it again and again? Why do we have to be reminded of, why is Father Lowry, why wasn't he here for just one year and then he's done? Why does he have to go through every cycle once, 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 again and again and again? And we hear the same Gospels again and again and again. And that's because uh, there's something about the truths upon which we found our lives which have a different character, a different texture than other truths in our lives. And so once you know the capital of Great Britain or Greece, for instance, you don't have to be reminded of it, uh, you know, 12 times a day. That would get wearisome. Uh, if you give a name to your dog, you don't have to, like, write it on, on your hand so that you remember what you named your dog. But the, 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 the truths which matter most in life, in life, the truths which aren't on the surface but are the deepest parts, the truths which, uh, which give us our ultimate meaning and purpose are not truths that are on the surface of things. These are the kind of truths which have to be sought for we have to look for them intentionally, and then once we find them, we have to fight for them. This is what it means when the scriptures call the world deceptive. The world in which we live is full of distraction and the dilution of truth. There are all kinds of ideas and visions and, and uh, worldviews that are coming at us from every corner. And the wear and tear of life, the wear and tear of life 
causes our capacity to live the truth we know to constrict and decay. Constantly we have to be reformed and renewed in our understanding of God's Word, in the truth about who we are, who He is, what the Church is, the meaning of creation. These are truths which constantly we have to be renewed in because we're in the midst of a great battle and because there's an enemy afoot who is a very powerful liar and who's constantly trying with all his energy and he is a being far greater than us in talent and intellectual capacity, constantly trying to get us to believe who's our grasp upon these fundamental truths about who we are and what our lives are about. That's why, strangely, we have to constantly not just be reminded, but allow ourselves to be reminded of these fundamental truths. Let me give you an example, in fact a central example, which is important in respect to the battle that we have at hand with the secular culture in which we live. And that's this. If you open the scripture, you will see on every single page this truth. We have been born into a great and tremendous drama. There is something happening of epic proportions all around us. This was a drama that started way before we were born and which will continue long after we're gone. The central character in this drama, the protagonist at the center of it, is not, of course, us, it is God. God, God is at the center of this drama. He who made all things and who holds all things together is at the center of a momentous drama into which we, as mere human creatures, lowly, you know who we are, we're just a handful of dust held together by some water, breathed into life. And we're invited in the greatest masterstroke of surprise and the conferral of dignity that we could ever imagine. We're invited to participate in this drama. If we choose to, then our lives become an epic adventure too because we're sharing in the adventure of his life, the great one who stands at the center of all things. If we choose instead to be marginal from him, to uh, somehow attempt to draw our life from any other source, our lives corrupt and diminish into a shadowy version of what they were supposed to be before. This truth about the world and our lives that we're born into an epic drama is apparently obvious. I say that it's apparently obvious because all around us, even in the culture that we live in, both in secular and in Christian literature, we see tokens of it. Think of uh, um, the Avengers and the Marvel comics. Think of the Star Wars saga, or the writings of J.R.R. Tolkien, or the Chronicles of Narnia. You see it all around this narrative that there's a great battle, in the Harry Potter series, and whatever, that there's a great battle between good and evil that's taking place, and that we have to take sides in, and then be courageous in the midst of it. So you see it kind of all around, and you think, well, that's, that's obvious, people understand it. But I just want to point out, and I want to point it out for you, you, you in this rising generation, you who are the hope and future, but who are so frustrating sometimes for those of us who have to care for you. you. <laughs> I just want to point out to you that there's a powerful counter-narrative at work. 
that resists this idea that life is a great drama. This counter-narrative is all around us and it's very powerful. And if you stop fighting for the first truth, you'll slip into it like that. And here's the counter-narrative. Life is not a great drama. Life is kind of a neutral place, like a playground or a field of opportunity. And it's meant to be characterized in a relatively uneventful way by pleasant things. Family and friends, and hobbies and vacations and a little bit of work and taking Instagram photos of our food. <laughs> and that's, that's what life is supposed to be like. And what's more, we deserve that kind of life. That life is owed to us by our parents, by our spouses and our friends, by our employers. We deserve that kind of life, and if we're not provided with it, that's not right. Some grave injustice has been done to us, and we should live from a fundamental place then of resentment. And our lives should be characterized at that point by a great refusal. A refusal. In other words, I refuse because I was owed these things and I don't have them. I refuse to live a life of purpose and meaning. And then my life is characterized not by gratitude, which is that which opens us to grace and to life and to joy, but rather by a, a, a steaming, uh, terrible kind of resentment. But if I am able to arrange my life as I want to, if I'm able to find in the midst of it friends and hobbies and vacations and a pleasant job that doesn't ask too much of me and in which I can kind of punch the clock and get money for the weekend, if I'm able to find that type of life, then I'm, I'm on the gravy train. Then I get to order my life as I want, and then I'm at the center of things. This vision, this powerful counter-narrative, if you take the gospel and touch it to this vision, at any point, it vanishes in a puff of sulfur and smoke. And it's shown to be a complete illusion, a siren song, a lie. Because that comfortable life is not what we were created for. We were created for greatness, and nobody owes us nothing. God, God is the center of life. And to be incorporated into his life, to find the truth of his life, to seek it, to find it, to fight for it, that's the great adventure of life. And anything less, that's not for us. I'll tell you what's interesting to me, and this is why I was shaking my finger at you just a little bit ago. <laughs> what's interesting to me, you know, um, I've got great people that I work with at the University of Mary. Way better people than I could ever deserve. And um, my brother, uh, I have a younger brother who's a priest too. He's the chaplain of the university. Um, my brother and I, we talk from time to time about some of the challenges that we face. And what I will say that I've observed, increasingly, I've been present for 10 years now at Mary. And then I taught high school before that, so I'm not like some naive, uh, um, uh, know nothing. Um, what I've observed is an increasing restlessness of heart among young people. Uh, this vision of life that you breathe in from the culture about how your life is supposed to be and what you should find if you're going to be happy. This vision makes you profoundly unhappy. People are telling you really stupid things all the time, like, you can be whatever you want to be. <laughs> 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 
or find your passion in followers. I think I see something of the good intention behind saying those kinds of things, but actually, in my experience, when you say that to a young person, you, you fill their life chock full of anxiety. Because that's a lot of pressure to say, you can be whatever you want to be. And it also is, a, I think it's a profound lie about how we're put together. Because God created us for something. And we can be happy if we find that. And it's a better thing than we would have thought of anyway. It's way better. Because he's more creative. <laughs> he, has, he has more foresight. And he put us together. And he didn't put us together like as junk or as an accident. He did it on purpose, each of us, with a dream for our lives. And to find that, that's the pearl of great price. Not whatever you want to be. Because whatever you want to be means you've got to make yourself up from the ground up. And that's a lot of pressure, and it fills the air with anxiety. And as a result, what I've seen is a profound sadness. Sometimes it's accompanied by legitimate and, and serious uh, mental health issues. But I think in general, I would characterize, and it's a great sadness to me, a sadness of a different kind, kind of a heartbrokenness, to see so many young people come to university, even to a place like the University of Maryland. Some of you have been there. It's kind of happy land, you know what I mean? It's a, it's a great place. Even in February, you hobby people, you know, people can't survive. Coats work, you just put them on and they work. It's not like we're dying all the time. You know, we light fires and sit in tents and... Anyway, um... And so what, what should be this extraordinarily joyful period of life, a time in which, a time that you'll never get back again. I mean, these days for you, they're amazing days. You have, you have the time in your life to foster friendships that will last far beyond this season, to read great books, to have great conversations, to come and hear Father Lowry's sermons here at Mass. You've got all of these profound opportunities and yet, there's a restlessness, a sadness, a, a, a profound anxiety, which I've seen uh, set upon this generation. Partly, it's because we've allowed ourselves to be so distracted and numbed. You said something like this in your homily tonight, that, that what we want to do somehow is rather, in the, you, I think you were speaking in context of the stillness, Father, of, of the evening, rather than, um, than, than taking that moment to hold our whole selves up to God and have Him tell us who we are. Instead, because we are afraid, we divert ourselves, we reach for our iPhone, we lose ourselves in distraction, we fragment ourselves so that we don't feel whole, but at, this, but at least we don't feel dead. You know, don't you, this now famous experiment which was done at the University of Virginia where they uh, took a group of young people your age and said to them, we're going to put you into a room and um, you'll be all alone for 25 minutes. The only thing in the room with you will be a button, which if you push it, will administer to you an extremely painful electric shock. Do you think that you'll push that button? Well, that's not a calculus question. So the majority of people said, no, I won't push the button. <laughs> to shock myself. And then the people were put in the room, 47% of the women and more than 60%, I think 65% of the men, administered to themselves one or more painful electric shocks because it was too desperately painful for them to be alone with themselves for 25 minutes. Blaise Pascal said long before that, in, 
it's probably an exaggeration, but it's a point. He said that the, the whole problem in the world is that a man can't be alone with himself and his own thoughts in his room for 15 minutes. We're incapable of this. And this makes us very unhappy. And it fills us as well with this constant modern plague of boredom. Boredom. Um, sometime, I hope, uh, you pick up this little book, <laughs> Lost in the Cosmos, by Walker Percy. Percy was a, um, a convert to Catholicism. He grew up in a family of great tragedy. His father, and probably his mother, uh, committed suicide. His uh, uncle committed suicide. He grew up in a house of uh, suicide, and he himself was uh, sorely tempted to it. He was trained as a physician and then uh, became a journalist, and then a novelist, wrote novels like The Movie Goer. But he wrote this funny little book, it's actually very, very funny, uh, called uh, Lost in the Cosmos, which he subtitled The Last Self-Help Book. And at the beginning of it, he puts a little quiz as to whether or not you need to read the book. It's so funny. And so there's a, there's a little quiz in which he engages in various thought experiments where you can like quiz yourself to give yourself a sense of whether or not you're lost in the cosmos, right? And so if you're lost in the cosmos, you have to read his self-help book. It's all tongue-in-cheek. The whole thing is drenched in irony. It's very funny, but, um, but it's not for everybody's taste. It, but it's very funny, unless you don't have a sense of humor or can't read. <laughs> anyway, one of the thought experiments that he does, one of the thought experiments that he has in this, um, uh, in this uh, um, in this quiz at the beginning it has to do with boredom. And he says, what is boredom? Why are we bored? Human beings are very funny, he says, that we should ever be bored at all. Under the conditions under which a human being is bored, a dog just goes to sleep. Are they superior to us in some way? <laughs> he says that, notice that the word boredom doesn't appear in any language in the world until sometime in the 18th century. Why is that? Was nobody bored until a couple of hundred years ago? And then he says, here's a thought experiment. Imagine that you are on a trip to Greece. It's at one of these group trips, you know, one of these bus tours. And you're staying at a comfortable hotel, and the food is nice, and you have an attractive guy. Like, she's articulate, but also she's pretty. And she, she wears one of these dresses, you know, that it's just, it, it's all very engaging. Uh, fine. And so, uh, then you go one day, and you see the Parthenon, which was, the Parthenon, as you know, was the temple of, of Athena, who was the goddess, the patron, patroness goddess of... Um, of Athens. And so on the Acropolis, you, you see the Parthenon. And you know what? It's so boring. Oh, it's boring. It looked better in the pictures. You see that there's kind of grass growing up between the stones, and um, uh, there's acid rain damage on the portico and on the columns. It's just, it's just kind of boring. And, uh, and you go back to your hotel, and you're dissatisfied. And then you ask yourself, why should I have been bored? Why? Why should I have been bored by seeing one of the great founts of Western civilization? Under great conditions, a comfortable bus, a motor coach with air conditioning, an attractive, articulate guy, good food, good hotel, why was I bored? Then he said, imagine a situation in which you would not be bored. You're a soldier defending Athens from a Soviet missile attack. You're high on a hill overlooking the city. Half a million residents of the city have already died that morning. You're behind a barricade of sandbags with binoculars looking over the city. Two missiles have just bracketed the Parthenon on the Acropolis, causing huge explosions and unspeakable damage. The next missile is sure to hit the Parthenon 
head on. And you are one of the last people who will ever see it in all of history. In that moment, a ray of light breaks through the clouds from the sun and hits the portico of the Parthenon. Are you bored? And the answer is, no! <laughs> the answer is that you're not bored. Why? It's the difference between seeing your life as a tourist and seeing your life as a soldier. That's the difference. If you live for a life of comfort, a life of self-satisfaction, if you are not continually fortifying yourself against the lies that the devil will tell you about who you are, who God is, what the world is for, unless you constantly are fighting for the truths which you've received, which re recreate and renew your soul, and cause you to stand up straight as you're meant to do as a child made in the image of God. Unless that happens for you, you will live a life, even though you might be comfortable, of utter boredom. Wabi Percy calls boredom the self stuffed with itself. <laughs> it's a devastating phrase. The self stuffed with itself. What happens to our lives when we believe the lie that we were made for comfort instead of for greatness is that our lives deteriorate into one damn thing after another. And there's no meaning, no purpose, sound and fury signifying nada, nothing. And that's not how we were supposed to live. It's certainly not, it's certainly not how men and women like you who have been given the gift of faith who are able to gather here in community at a place like the Newman Center, who have a spiritual father like Father Lowry, who have God's own goodness in your lives. It's not how you were meant to live. But if you think it's automatic, if you think you can just coast through, if you think that it's ever gonna get easier before you die. <laughs> but I have this word for you, and I say this to our students at the University of Mary too, Life is hard, but it's good. Life is hard, but it's good. And the fight is worth it. And it's filled with joy. And God's power is all around us. And he's fighting for us. And all we need to bring to it is an openness and receptivity to his grace and just a little bit of human grit. I know uh, the grandmother of Katie Ledecky, she's a donor, to the University of Mary, you know, the, uh, <laughs> the, the Washington Post had this article about Katie Ledecky not long ago, and the headline was <laughs> how Katie Ledecky became better at swimming than anybody's ever read of anything. <laughs> uh, Katie, her grandmother sent it to me immediately. She, she just, she had a little smile on her face. How, how Katie Ledecky became better at swimming than anybody's ever read of anything. Um, but there's a story, if you read the book Grit by Angela Duckworth, who's a, a, a social scientist, um, a very interesting book, she, um, she tells a story about Katie Ledecky's first race in a pool. So she was a little girl, and, and she goes to the pool, and she swims from one side to the other, and she gets out, and her dad said to her, Katie, this is on tape, she said, Katie, how is it? And she said, great! And she was, she, she said, great, and then she waited for a few seconds, and then she said, that was hard. And then she smiled ear to ear. I love this image. I love it, I love it, I love it. She said, how was it, Katie? It was great. That was hard. <laughs> and then she lights up. That's the way we have to live our lives. That's how it's supposed to be. That's the, that's the adventure of life with God. And in the meantime, it's a really good idea to trust him. Because when darkness comes, when we don't see our way forward, he sees. He sees. And we're firmly in his hand. I can't come to a Newman Center less than a year after the canonization of John Henry Newman without ending with something from him. 
something you've heard before, but then something maybe you haven't heard, because uh, we're experts in the Catholic Church at, at, um, at uh, condensing things. Give me just a second, I'll find it. So here's what you've heard before. God has created me for some definite purpose. I'm created to do something or to be something for which no one else is created. I have a place in God's counsels, in God's world, which no one else has. Remember he says this, you've heard it before, where he says that each of us is important in our own place for the salvation of the world, for his plan as an archangel is in his. Do you believe that about yourself? Do you believe that, that God cares as much about you standing at your post, taking up your arms, fighting the battle for you, as important to him as St. Michael the Archangel? Do you believe that? It's a, it's a great calling, and it's so much better than comfort, than sort of comfortable mediocrity. It's what you were made for. Whether I be rich or poor, despised or esteemed by man, God knows me and calls me by my name. God has created me to do him some definite service. He has committed some work to me which he has not committed to another. So you've heard that in various forms before. But have you heard what comes next? God knows what is my greatest happiness, but I do not. Thus, God leads us by strange ways. We know he wills our happiness, but we, know, we neither know what our happiness is, nor the way we are blind. Let us put ourselves into his hands and not be startled, even though he leads us by a strange way. Let us be sure he will lead us right. It's hard for us, isn't it? We who are so attached to the world, we who breathe the air of the culture all around us and feel constantly tempted to slouch back into former ways before the conversion of our minds and hearts. But this is the way for us. It's the only really true way for us to live. And it's a pathway, a sure pathway, through darkness to light through pain and suffering, as Father preached about tonight, into true belonging, happiness, and deep joy. That's my prayer for all of you, especially as Lent dawns upon us. May it be for you a time of very sad brightness. <laughs> God bless you all. I'm happy to take just a few questions. If you like. What do we have, Father? Ten minutes, and then I turn into a pumpkin. <laughs> Questions, comments, insults. <laughs> yeah, How old Harvard you? University. <laughs> There's a guy who believes he's created for greatness. <laughs> I just put through it, but uh, how long have you been a Monsignor? Oh, I don't know. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, maybe like 2014, something like that. I don't know. It was the very end of Pope Benedict the Sixteenth. I was in the last batch of seniors made by Benedict the Sixteenth. But you know that the the, the whole thing is um, it's just something hard to spell. It, <laughs> it's, it's it's purely an honorific. The, the, my favorite thing that I've ever heard about seniors is do you know what a box elder bug is? Do you have those down here? They're these bugs that appear kind of in the fall when the sun comes out and they have little spots on them. And uh, a priest said once that a senior is like a box elder bug. They have spots, because you know we wear cassocks with the, uh, with the fuchsia uh, buttons. And uh, nobody knows what they're good for. <laughs> I like to say it was a clerical error. <laughs> Five. So, is the tagline for University of Mary for 
life? For life. Does it tie into what you're talking about tonight? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's from our overall strategic plan going out to, to the year 2030, which was entitled Education for the Whole of Life. Education for the Whole of Life. But we love that for life because it means that it's a way of seeing life. Of course, we're pro-life as well. You know what I mean? We, we fight for uh, unborn children, for uh, the elderly, for the vulnerable. Um, uh, it, it has... Uh, that whole sense of, um, of the deep drama and adventure that I was talking about earlier. Yeah, I love it. it, it our tagline is universal married for life. And uh, you should be for something, not just against everything. Don't you think? Uh, that's what I think, anyway. I don't know. <laughs> yes? Can you describe your vocation story? Yeah, sure, but you're going to be disappointed. So, <laughs> no, no, I mean, seriously, you'll be deeply disappointed. Uh, it's funny, um, it's funny, I, uh, um, I tell something of this story in a dumb little pamphlet that I wrote. So, the, the national, the NCDVD, what, what is that? How do you say it? National Conference, Conference of Diocesan and Vocation Veterans. The NCDVD has published this little, um, this little, uh, um, a uh, series of, of, of booklets, uh, of which uh, Father Lowry has on display two of them, not the one I wrote, but the other two. <laughs> one of them is, is Jesus Calling Me to Be a Catholic Priest, and the other one, which was written by um, Senior Tom Richter, who's a priest of Bismarck, um, and whom I've known for, for many years. And uh, the other one, uh, um, Have I Been With You, uh, is written by Father Paul Hazy, who is my best friend uh, in seminary. Uh, and uh, who now is the Dean of Seminarians or some other thing at Kenner Glennon Seminary in St. Louis, Missouri. Anyway, I, I wrote a little book called Ecclesial Discernment, and so I think it's, it's the title just isn't very sexy. <laughs> you know, I think it's a terrible title. Uh, I put it on the publisher. Um, but um, but the, the point that I make in it, and this is why I say it's boring, because everybody has these amazing vocation stories. You know what I mean? I was running a liquor store and you know, <laughs> selling porn, and, and then God like hit me and, and with a thunderbolt, and I, I broke off my engagement, and I you know, sold my Maserati, and you know, it was all this stuff, and I'm like, oh my goodness. And so here's my vocation story. When I was a little boy, the priests in our parish, who were members of the, the, the Society of the Precious Blood, uh, which is an order founded by St. Gaspar de Buffalo, they were kind of missionary priests, and um, the Precious Blood Fathers in our parish were great guys, and they were great to us kids, um, and they were happy, and I wanted to be like them. And so I thought maybe I should be a priest, but I also wanted to be a policeman. Um, <laughs> so I didn't know. Uh, and, and so I wanted to be a priest from the time I was a little boy, and then I forgot about it for a little while. Then I went to college, and then uh, it was clear that I should enter the seminary. I did enter the seminary, and then I liked it, and they didn't kick me out, and I became a priest. <laughs> but, but, what, but what's terrible, I mean, what's, what's it, so maybe it's not boring, because I just told you you don't have to be bored, right? It's, it's a great, it, it, for me, it's been a great adventure. But it wasn't the kind of adventure where I was in a lot of psychological pain about whether I was going to be a priest or not. I just trusted the church, and I figured um, that, that uh, if, if they didn't want me to be a priest, they'd, get, they'd kick me out and I'd have other options, you know. Um, and so, it, and I prayed, and I studied, um, and the Lord was really, really good to me. And what's interesting is, if you ask my brother, he has a very similar story. There, 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 there wasn't a whole lot of drama for him. And I think it was, our parents really raised us to really love the church and trust the church. And so we realized that we weren't ever discerning by ourselves. You know what I mean? It wasn't ever like, I have to figure this out. I never, and it wasn't because I was super wise or anything. I just never thought, oh, I have to figure this out. And that's helped me in terms of the work I've done as a priest too, both working in a high school and then running a university. I'm kind of an institution guy. I love institutions. Um, and love kind of figuring them out and seeing how they can work better and, um, and, and, and uh, looking at things and then saying, well, we can't do this right now, but we can sure do this, and we did this already, but now it's slipping and let's get it back. All of that stuff for me is just great. Um, 
because I, I think that um, I think that God cares about that, <laughs> and so um, so that's sort of my vocation uh, story. May you have uh, peace in your discernment too, um, unless you don't you shouldn't have peace. Um, <laughs> then may you have turmoil. <laughs> Everybody's story is different. God's amazing. He's very creative. <laughs> what else, everybody? Yes? What's your favorite book? Oh, man. So I don't know. I mean, when, so here's the problem for me. When people ask me what, and this happened just today. We were talking about favorite things. And uh, I don't have, like, a Julie Andrews song. Soft warm kittens and warm summer kittens. I don't remember. I, mean, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I should probably write one. It would make this moment easier. But what happens for me is that I just say what I really like. Uh, and then, um, you know, uh, there's a book by G.K. Chesterton, Orthodoxy. Have you seen it? That's a great book. It's a, just a great book. Um, uh, Prayer for Beginners by Peter Craved. Uh, it was very helpful to me at a certain point in my life. I don't know if I'd say today a, a novel by C.S. Lewis called Till We Have Faces, which for me is just is one of these heart-wrenching, life-changing explications of the, the texture and tone of human love, both uh, how human beings interact with divine love and how they love each other badly and well. Um, yeah, so here are a few. There are others too, but I just, yeah. Um, yeah. I also like pizza. <laughs> I like Chick fil A, that was nice, huh? Yes. New Rockford, North Dakota. That's great. She's from a very auspicious place. It's a great place. Um, do you have any? Would you give us some like practical tips on how to live a season of bright sadness like this Lent, or like things to take to prayer? Yeah, I, I certainly will. So when I was in Rome, one of the things that happens in Rome during Lent is this practice called the Station Churches, and so the sort of the forty oldest churches, more or less, in the city of Rome. I'm using that a little bit loosely because there's some variation there, but the the the, the forty kind of most, um, the 40 kind of legacy churches in Rome each have their own day during Lent. And um, what happens is that at the North American College where I studied for the priesthood, during Lent a group of guys will get up really, really early in the morning and make a pilgrimage to that church. Sometimes these churches are closed all through the year and it's the only time you can see them. But even if they're not closed, oftentimes they're kind of jammed full of tourists and stuff. But what happens is, when you go early during Lent, uh, you get to celebrate Mass there, kind of in the choir, and you see the churches it's meant to be seen. It's very lovely. And then, of course, the readings of Lent, the prayers of Lent, are just so potent. And more than that, um, we would say the rosary walking through the streets of Rome before all the tourists have, have woken up, and so it'd be in the choir of the cobblestone. And, and, um, and you see how people out sweeping the streets and the sort of the, the soothing um, sound of early morning work, the, the, the day breaking, the smell of freshly baking cornetti and other bread, um, the, the brewing of coffee, it was amazing. And so I would do this and um, as part of my Lenten practice. And one time, um, I got a visitor from the United States who had been the professor at Catholic University who had directed my, my, my master's thesis in philosophy. And I remember when he directed the thesis, he would take red uh, pens and cross out whole pages. You're wrong, you're wrong. You're wrong. So, you know, and so we were still friends. Because, you know. So he and I were having coffee on the Borgo Pio, which is a little street near the Vatican. And, um, and uh, I said to him, you know, for Lent, like the last couple of years, I've been doing these station churches. And, and uh, I almost feel bad because I kind of enjoy it, you know, and you're not supposed to enjoy um, uh, you know, what you're doing at Lent. 
And he said, well, you're wrong again. <laughs> he said, you're wrong again. He said, Lent isn't about doing deadly things. It's about dealing death to the deadly. That's what he said. I've never forgotten that. I think it's very good. Uh, and so here's a practical thing. Sometimes the, the practices of penance prayer and almsgiving uh, that we're called to in the midst of the Lenten season will uh, have um, a chastening effect upon our bodily appetites. They're meant to. It's not supposed to be easy. But it's also not supposed to be torture. You know what I mean? Don't try and be a hero. You know, Jesus is the hero. And so um, just plug into that. And so uh, the, the practices of Lent are not supposed to be deadly in and of themselves. They're supposed to deal death to the deadly. In other words, the death that we have in us by virtue of the fall is meant to be put to death by God's radiant grace operating in us. And Lent is a great time because it is a season of special grace. In other words, that it is, it's the time of favor. It's an acceptable time. It's the moment in which we can really full-throatedly ask for God's help because he's told us particularly he wants us to and he's ready to assist us. And so a little bit of practical advice is to remember that. It's the best practical advice I ever got in respect to Lent. Uh, it's not about doing deadly things. It's about dealing death to the deadly. Everybody, I'm so pleased to be with you. Why don't we uh, give glory to God and, and, and fill our hearts with gratitude for the chance to be together, and then maybe we'll be in heaven pretty soon. And um, that would be great. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. May Almighty God bless you all and keep you safe, fill you with grace, give you greatness of soul, give you great humility and holiness in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks for listening, everybody. Great to meet you.